Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mark Wessels, who is the Director of Education at the Zildjian Company, and we're talking about Vic Firth today, which is a company under Zildjian. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Bart. It's great to be here. Vic Firth is just one of those companies that is just, I just think they do everything right. Um, you guys, everything is very clean and just great products. We're going to get to the drumstick stuff, but first, I think we need to take it way back and learn about the man, Vic Firth, uh, that the company's named after. And I want to preface that with, I've had multiple people say in videos that I'll post online, wow, I didn't know Vic Firth was an actual guy. So Vic Firth was a man. <laughs> so why don't you tell us about him? Yeah. And it's it's kind of amazing because he was uh, so prolific in everything that he did that he was famous as a timpanist for the Boston Symphony. Hmm. He was the youngest timpanist or the youngest member of the Boston Symphony ever. Uh, he was an author. He, he wrote many uh, uh, solo books and, and ensembles and different things. He was also a great teacher, taught at the uh, Boston Conservatory, New England Conservatory of Music. Uh, he had so many aspects of his life, and he was just one of the best at everything he did. The drumsticks just kind of grew out of that. And it's one of those stories of it being really part of his personality, the way the company was founded, the way it was run, the uh, the goals were were basically the man and not a you know a desire to sell as many drumsticks as we possibly could. Yeah. What year what when was he born? Just so we can kind of put it in perspective. So he was born in 1930. Okay. So quite a long time ago. His dad was a band director, believe it or not, a trumpet player. Uh from Vic telling me, I worked I, I've been at Vic's Firth and uh, Zildjian now for since 2000. So I've, I knew Vic for quite a long time, mm. and we would he would tell stories about growing up and his his father uh, in Maine because he's from Maine, Winchester, Maine. Uh, he grew up in Sanford, Maine, but um, his father wanted him to play trumpet because that's what his father did, and he said that he tried it and he just couldn't stand it, and finally his his dad gave way and let him play the drums. Cool, yeah. <laughs> But he also played the uh, trombone and clarinet. And he said none of those got the girls. So, uh, you know, he just stuck with the drums. Wow. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> I um, A couple days ago, I, I think it'll probably be out before this, but I, I did uh, an interview with Steve Fittick about Joe Morello. And it was something similar where Joe was like a very accomplished violinist and it just he switched to the drums like you get these guys maybe it's something in the boston area but um you get these guys who were just so good at all these like very multiple different instruments that's I, that happens a lot today but it's just something really special and i guess it's that uh, orchestral kind of world it was different then there wasn't rock bands and you know that i guess that was what you would you know you would aspire to be doing is is more of the orchestral realm yeah it's uh it's it's different in that you know they had the time on their hands to really focus mm -hmm. <laughs> you you think about this all of the time of of yeah. are we so uh broad now that we're not actually learning anything you know the yeah. one of the things that vic always said was that you know there wasn't a lot to do but um you know the focus and then especially early on the personality type you know Vic really thought that he could be good at anything that he did because it was his personality, his drive, his initiative. So if he played the trumpet, he'd be one of the better trumpet players in the world, you know. So yeah. I, it was kind of a mindset, I think, that no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to be the best at it. That's so interesting. Yeah, he... Um, I don't think it's an accident. It's not one of those things where he's like, I'm sure he is has a virtuosity to him, but there's clearly a bunch of hard work and I'm sure we'll learn later. It, it will cross over into his business world. But, um, so you mentioned, uh, I believe before we were recording though, his, his, uh, working with George Lawrence stone and funny side note on that. Um, I had Barry James on here who, um, was one of Stone's students and I'm actually taking some online lessons from him now, but 
he learned from Vic Firth as well because it was at the Boston Conservatory where Stone was a teacher, I believe. Mm-hmm. Did am I mistaken, or and I think Barry said this? Did Stone and Vic Firth teach at the college at the same time? <laughs> well, it's an interesting story because uh, yes, Vic studied with. Uh, George Lawrence Stone, and he also studied with Saul Goodman, who is a timpanist. Mm-hmm. And um, while he was in college, the uh, principal job at the symphony opened, the uh, uh, percussion job at the symphony opened. And instead of aud- instead of auditioning, as they do now, both George Lawrence Stone and Saul Goodman said, you need that guy. And so they came and got Vic while he was still a student at the conservatory, still studying with Stone, um, and became the youngest percussionist ever, of, or the youngest member of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So wow. he was only 21 when he landed that that first gig, the first gig of being in the Boston Symphony. That's wild. 21. 21. So one of the funny stories was Vic was still in college. And he was a terrible piano player, and he still had not passed his piano proficiencies. And um, but he was also teaching at the college because, as a member of the Boston Symphony, you become a teacher. So he was a student, he was teaching, and he refused to take his piano proficiencies and said, "I, I just won't graduate. Hmm. I've already got the gig. You, you don't, you know, I don't, I don't need a degree." <laughs> and they, yeah. they said, okay, well, that's, that's fine. Your, your piano is good enough. <laughs> yeah. So. Seriously. Wow. That's uh, and, and timpani, I'm actually working on another episode about me, like the history of, of timpani, because being a drum set guy, I don't know anything about playing the timpani. Um, and that's something I'm excited to learn more about, but it's, it's very cool to, uh, to see it. And it's, it's, it's totally a different world obviously than playing, you know, in rock bands and stuff or session stuff, that symphonic world, it just takes a different, uh, um, I was talking to someone today about Broadway drummers and he was saying it is a, it is night and day from just saying you can go play in a rock band. And I feel like that falls in that same world of you're reading and you're listening and you're just following along and you, you, you know, you might hit it once or twice in a, in a couple minutes, but it's very important. Right. And, and timpani is that way. I, I play timpani and, you know, have played with a few minor symphony orchestras and played percussion and played drum set. But timpani has that level of uh, professionalism and musicality that because it, it's a lot like a, a lot of symphonic playing where you play so little mm-hmm. that every note becomes that much more important. Yeah. So the the tuning, the interpretation, the you know how you're fitting within the orchestra, uh, it's an amazing thing to see. And Vic was, you know, arguably one of the best timpanists in the history of of percussion. Hmm. Uh, certainly, most well known even before he he started playing uh, or started making drumsticks. But um, just watching him play with the symphony as I as I first started working there and going to symphony rehearsals, he was like the drum set player of the symphony. They could be a little bit out of time, not really cohesive, but as soon as he came in, the time just settled mm-hmm. because he was so much a fundamental part of that orchestra. God, that's so cool. It's it's uh it's one of those things too that you you got to put it into perspective for me of like so he was already a successful in the timpani and the musicians world very a famous musician not just what became this internationally well-known brand of you know percussion stuff like sticks and everything so he was already an established um musician so you said that was about the age of like 21 when he was with the boston uh symphony orchestra then why don't we move forward there? So, so how long did he play with them? Did he did did he ever do any like jazz band playing and like on the drum set or anything like that? Well, actually, yeah. I, when he was in high school, he started his own band and he was the leader of a band. Um, he played drum set. He also played jazz vibraphone. Oh, cool! And they toured, and he would gig out his band to the high schools around the main, you know, New England area. 
and charge five cents. He was he was an entrepreneur when he was in high school. Mm. So he had a little bit of drum set abilities, but you know, primarily he was a concert percussionist, I would say. Got it. That's his thing, which, you know, he's he's yep. clearly he, good uh, at. It. Yeah, he he played um well, he started when he was 21 and he retired 50 years later. So <laughs> really? he had a long he had a long run at the at the, even while he's running his company all the way up until uh, you know like he he decided to retire from the symphony he was running the company and still going to rehearsals and still oh. you know what? doing so concerts you'd, and you'd go on a Saturday night to see you know the Boston Symphony and you would depending on you know subs or whatever you would see Vic Firth playing. Oh yeah, he was. Uh, they used to when I was in high school, and I'm I'm 58 now. But uh, they used to have the Boston Symphony every Sunday night on television, and I used to watch it because I was fascinated with Vic Firth, the man, or the Vic Firth, the timpani player. And um, you know, I'd, I'd watch Vic play all of this literature on TV. God, Believe it or not, they awesome. had symphonies every Sunday night. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I so. think of and and uh, you know it's it's jumping ahead, but like there's a modern drummer festival where it's God I forget who was in it Don Lombardi, Vic Firth, uh, there's a couple other people who were like the legends of whatever and uh, watching him play the timpani it's um it's amazing it's just very cool that's that's great to know he never <laughs> I mean I had no <laughs> idea that he was still uh, still doing that for so long so then. All right, so we know that basically through everything we talk about, that is happening. He's still playing with the Boston Symphony. That's that's going. Then what the you know that's probably what since like the fifth. He was born in the thirties. Then that was probably in like the fifties. Yeah, early fifties. Okay. And then, um, so he uh, basically he was playing the symphony, and he was very unsatisfied with the the products that he had to play with because he didn't have a lot of there weren't a lot of choices back Mm -hmm. then for drumsticks in the late 50s so he like hand whittled a pair of sticks um and actually i I have a picture of it because we found it after after he had passed and found it in his uh crates his daughters found it cool and had his uh the original SD one and he carved his name in them uh-huh. like the, the original uh, SD ones. He, he would actually carve his name Wow, That's <laughs> and so cool. uh, he, he made his own products for him to play. And then, um, you know, and that was when he was 25, 26, you know, 28 and, and his students being the way students are at the Boston Conservatory just wanted to buy those because obviously if they're good enough for Vic, then so he eventually started, uh, he got a wood turner in, in I think Montreal to, uh, to turn his first drumsticks hmm. and they'd get five pair done at a time or 10 pair done, done at a time. So. <laughs> Man, that I want to ask you later on about the process uh, to some degree. And I know there's moisture and there's all this stuff. But at that point, being 25, 26, was he a woodworker? He sounds like he's kind of a renaissance man, you know, really good <laughs> at just whatever he did. But he, did he, he is. Did he know he, about that stuff? He is. Well, I don't know that he was that, you know, had any any. Uh, talent in woodworking. I think he just, he knew kind of what he wanted and he tinkered around with things, uh, whether he, he never told me whether he took another pair of sticks and, and, and changed that or took a dowel rod and, and fashioned his own, but he had a very, very in tune sense of how a stick needs to balance in the hand. Mm-hmm. And and so I think he played around with it based off of those two models. The SD1 is kind of a general drumstick for a lot of things. And then he made a SD2 a Bolero for softer playing. And they're very much balanced towards those two very specific type of things. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think, you know, I think he was a tinkerer. And then he, you know, started making his own timpani mallets and, he just wanted things a certain way. He couldn't get it by buying somebody else's, so he just said, "I'll make my own." Yeah, really. What is does does SD stand for anything? Snare drum. 
Oh, <laughs> duh. Okay. I hate to be uh, hate to be obvious, but <laughs> well, yeah, no, and that makes sense though. Um, and the T one timpani mallet stands for timpani, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll ask the stupid questions that other people might be uh, <laughs> might be thinking. Um, okay, that's really cool. Now, uh, what do you know? What the competition was at that point? Like, I don't think it would have been any brands that are really around today. I mean, we're was it a deal where like you would get drumsticks that were made by like different like like Rogers would make drumsticks or Ludwig would make drumsticks? Was it was that who was making them or um, do you know the competition? Yeah, I think there there are quite a number of you know smaller manufacturers back then. Certainly, Ludwig made drumsticks. Capella, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Vader made drumsticks, though they weren't Vader drumsticks back then. Yeah. And um, Vic made drumsticks, or he when he started, it was not really, you know, he would he would tour back when orchestras toured. They would they would go across the country, they go around the world. Every time he would go somewhere into a new city, he would go to Frank's Drum Shop in Chicago, or you know, different drum shop, and he would take his sticks and try to sell them. Yeah. And it's funny. I've got a I've got an invoice uh, for Frank's Drum Shop, dated January twentieth, nineteen sixty four, where he sold Frank's Drum Shop one General Timpani mallet, <laughs> one staccato, one wood. Uh, he didn't buy any drumsticks though. It was all uh, wow, Timpani mallets. So he he sold. No, he did uh, one General snare drumstick, two dollars and fifty cents. Boy, so that's a his real first order. Trial first run. order for. <laughs> <laughs> First order for Frank's Drum Shop was twenty five dollars. Oh and boy, Vic was Vic was on his way as a master drumstick maker. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so rewind just a little bit. When did it go from making them at home to like when did he get incorporated as a business? This is what I love too about this is it's it's born out of necessity. It's not. He's searching for there's, you know, oh, I can make money doing this. I can change the tip of the stick a little bit, which is also a very valuable thing, you know, inventing new things. But he's really sees a problem and needs to fix it. So so when did he actually become a company? I think that um, 1963 would have been the the beginning of Vic Firth as a company. I guess he just registered that. Hmm. I don't know that his, you know, his intent was to you know, dominate the, uh, the stick and mallet world or anything like that. He just, he was selling, so he needed to incorporate and, you know, so he just established the company then, but he was selling only tens of sticks, yeah. <laughs> not, yeah. not hundreds. Um, no, it's, so he he had a design. Basically, he would take it to a wood turner and a wood turner would, uh, set up a lathe and they would crank out as many sticks as, uh, you know, as he ordered and, and the company just started growing a little bit at a time. But a lot of that was just because Vic had a pretty high tolerance for what he was willing to accept. And one of the things that he was willing to accept was that the sticks weren't warped. <laughs> they had to be straight and he would hand roll them uh, himself on the dining on his dining room table. And any sticks that were warped, he just took out of, you know, took that out of his profit. Hmm. So, so he was kind of that first, uh, you know, quality control guy, but he did it with his wife, uh, when his daughters were too young to participate. Yeah. So. Wow. And it's, it's obviously, I don't think he would have been at the problem then of like sourcing massive amounts of wood. I'm sure he, at that point probably could have, you know, gotten lumber or whatever from a local source, whereas. I'm sure it's different. No, now, you know, and a lot of a lot of the companies that were wood turners back then, and, and interesting enough, they had he had five different companies that were making his sticks. You know, as as it progressed, uh, Capella was a wood turning company who also made drumsticks. Uh, was one of the manufacturers of Vic sticks very early on. Vader actually made Vic sticks. Very wow. early on, before they were the Vader company, yeah, uh, but because they turned uh, so a company in Maine, which he actually 
wound up buying was called Banton. And Banton was one of the first wood turners that used a stone grind to uh, create their their models and they made all kinds of stuff they made the uh the bottle caps for the english leather aftershave you're probably too young to remember that but um (laughs) yeah (laughs) they made uh they made which is kind of strange the electrolux vacuum cleaners the real high-end vacuum cleaners had a beater bar in a vacuum cleaner that was a piece of wood because plastic wasn't good enough back then for the high rotation high uh high Uh, temperature that it got to because of the vacuum cleaner so they made the beater bars for all of the vacuum cleaners for electrolux and you know the high-end vacuum cleaners Hmm. and and so you know the wood turner had business from a lot of different sources and then you know vic firth was just one of their customers that said i need this and i need 25 pair i need 50 pair i need 100 pair yeah that's interesting it's very uh I mean, that's the way it goes is you need something he because, again, like you said, at that point, he wasn't really going, this is going to be my business. I'm going to do it. I'm a woodworker. He was just trying to, again, you know, um, he he needed a supplier. So that's just the the way it goes. Okay, Um, that's cool. And then so obviously, I mean, man, the company starting in 1963, technically, that is right there next year. Drum sets blow up. We got Ringo. Um, that had to be good. That had to, you know, more drummers are starting to play. Music is changing. Rock and roll is happening. Um, that had to affect things a little bit. And, and, and then I'm sure it just progressed from there. Right. 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 And that's, that's when he (laughs) branched out of the symphonic, you know, I don't, uh, SD ones and SD twos and T ones and T twos were great, but, um, you know, drum set sticks are kind of where it's at. And he started with the the maple sticks because he had a, you know, he already were the SD uh, models were being made out of maple. And then he went to Hickory because obviously, you know, many of the drummers at the time needed sticks that would hold up. So so that's when the 5A came about and the mm. 7A that, you know, those models. Yeah. So to clarify that there was, um, and I, I did an episode about the history of drumsticks a while back where it was, um, uh, where we were going through the classifications and stuff, but did Vic, was he the one who basically labeled it as a 5A, a 7A and all that type of stuff? You know, I, I talked to him about that and I think that that was pretty well established before okay. he started making 5As. If, and, you know, and he yeah. didn't, as you talk to almost anybody, they don't really know the story. You know, A is acoustic and B is band yes. and S is street. And, you know, everybody kind of knows the stories, but how they came about the five, the, you know, like, why is it smaller numbers or bigger numbers <laughs> yeah. for smaller sticks yeah. uh, in one? But, you know, the opposite in another. I don't, I don't know any of that, but I don't think that Vic had anything to do with that. I think he started off by... You know, just the the most popular sticks um, is what he started with. He he did a lot of maple sticks that were, you know, the he would call on the whacker or the hammer or the, you know, <laughs> yeah, those type of things. But sure. uh, if I remember correctly, one story goes that it was uh, Bill Ludwig who kind of popularized certain titles of names or added them to those Ludwig sticks that we, we were talking about. So that's one theory um that can be you know take that everyone who's listening go you know do some research but uh okay so where is this all taking place this is in boston correct right and uh the company has vic lived in boston of course Mm -hmm. and uh it was separated and and they didn't actually buy the factory until the mid to late 90s this factory was always turning wood it it went from five different wood turners that i said you know vader and capella and banton and kingfield and and all of this uh what the difficulty was is that no one of those manufacturers because they made these huge amounts of products for other companies could singularly do vic firth so some of them were on lathes 
But Banton was the only company who had a stone grind uh, machine. So you could get a 5A from Vic Firth during that time period, and they could have different shapes to them, <laughs> <laughs> depending on which which place they were coming out of. Yeah. So that was one of Vic's big, we have, to, we have to settle on one manufacturer. And at the time, Banton, who was also making uh, pepper mills and grinding, uh, grinding pepper mills and grinding uh, uh, rolling pins and all of that, they were, they were doing all of that at the time that Vic bought the company. Okay. So that was the first time that they consolidated and they, they started making everything in one place. And then all the sticks were, were stone ground instead of lathe. Can you explain? I think we know the other way where it would be a lathe where it, the stick is spinning really fast. And then they would kind of like, you know, with whatever, a piece of metal, I don't know the technical terms, kind of shape it. The stone grinding. How does that work? So, yeah, the uh, the back knife is, you know, it's just basically a knife that mm-hmm. goes in the uh, the programmed, um, you know, shape of what you want to do, basically slides up the stick and just shears the stick with a knife. Um, but the stone ground is a large stone that has the impression of a stick in the profile. And then a, a dowel rod is... Uh, spinning and it presses the dowel into the stone. So instead of anything uh, like a lathe going across from the tip all the way to the butt, uh, you know, basically ripping the uh, ripping that it basically sands it all at one time. Hmm. So there's cool. two stones. There's a stone for the tip side, and then there's a stone for the butt side because some butts have a different shape to them. Any lathe stick is always pretty much just chopped off at the end. You know, they can they can uh, yeah kind of round it out just a little bit, but anything that's that's lathe is going to be just flat at the end. But the uh, the stone ground, uh, you know, it, it's a much more refined process, and and I believe that uh, Promark has gone to that, and you know maybe maybe a couple of others, but uh, it always made a much more consistent product. And and also hickory being uh, sinuous wood that it is a back knife sometimes can rip a little bit you know can pull a little bit of the sinuous uh, threads out of the stick but hmm. that's you know not too much yeah man there's so many there's those like processes of I'm sure that's been that that woodworking process was developed over a long time before drumsticks and everything but God stuff like that you hear about it and you're like I would never have thought. And I, I actually do think I posted a video on uh, Instagram of of your guys. It was an old video of your your process of stick making. And I kind of rem- I'm going to have to repost it when we when we release this. But of of seeing a bunch of rocks doing like like the stone. It was something with stones doing it. And um, right. and I was thinking, wow, I wonder I wonder what that process is. So so now I know. Yeah, I mean, I think the the whole process over years and years and years was just a constant trying to make something better, you know, all the way through the yeah. early, early on. I, there, there's so many stories of, of the, the things that Vic, you know, uh, started, you know, one of the very first things that he started doing was pitch pairing and weight matching his sticks. Uh, yes. That was not a thing <laughs> back yeah. when he first started. I, he he told me the story, and I think it's probably out there that um, you know he was carrying a, a bundle of sticks and he dropped them, and he just noticed that every one of them made a different sound when they hit the floor. And so he thought, well, what if what if I tried to match these pitches up? You know, then I could have sticks that actually, when I hit them with both of my hands, they would sound the same. Hmm. And and this is a story that interesting enough, the early guys that worked for Vic uh, actually worked at his house in the basement. He would get a, a delivery of you know a box of sticks from a wood turner, and then they would sit on the floor of his basement and drop the sticks one at a time and and try to make a scale out of it and then match up the sticks and then put a rubber band around it. So, oh, that's so <laughs> that was funny. the earliest earliest. Uh, um, pairing machine was a bunch of guys sitting on the floor of Vic's basement, and, wow. 
That's and one funny. of the guys that uh, worked there told me it was it was always a special day when when uh, Olga did laundry because they would turn on the uh, the the dryer and it heated the basement. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's like look at where Vic Firth is now, the company like. But I love yeah. hearing, though, that it's like, you know, they're excited when the 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 dryer runs to get some heat in this kind of basement. <laughs> I mean, that's like. You you forget sometimes because Vic Firth is so huge that the origins of it. Yeah. Well, one of the funny stories was that his wife nagged him and said, you got to get these guys off the basement floor. This is not, you know, like that. That's not that's not nice. You yeah. know, so he he got uh, he tried to get a uh, a stone that he could, you know, put it up on a table and he poured some concrete and the, you know, the uh, the sticks did not make a sound when you hit against concrete. It just wasn't. You know, just wasn't heavy enough or dense enough. So he had a friend uh, in Maine that had a, uh, believe it or not, a, <laughs> a tombstone shop. They made tombstones for, uh, particularly, you know, at, on, in the war they would they would make tombstones for soldiers, and then you know if if they didn't pick them up or use them, then he just had them in the back of his place. So Vic went and got a couple of tombstones <laughs> and that was the early place where the guys finally got off the floor they set the tombstone in a in a box with some sand in it and then they they paired their luckily the guys told me that the uh the names were face down so they didn't oh, have man. to look at a you know. yeah i was gonna say like uh he's like guys i got a big surprise for you it's gonna get better this is great and it's like oh thanks vic it's a tombstone <laughs> for a soldier great man yeah but, but uh, it was a business other, at that point, right? Like they were doing this enough to like, it's almost just like one of those, like, um, like, like, a there's just like a success story of a business where, you know, Apple computers is born in a garage. Like, yep. And it was, uh, you know, it was so small that it wasn't full-time work for any of the guys. They were teachers, they were players in the Boston area and they would, you know, they, they at least could make, some money with sticks in her hand so they they took the job but hmm. um so the development of the actual uh machine or computer pairing <laughs> was interesting because uh vic's daughter kelly was married to an mit professor who was kind of a computer guy back you know in the in the mid 80s hmm. to the late 80s i think he he was over the house and he saw the guys doing this and said you know i can I can write a computer program to do that. Like, you know, computers were so new that yeah. the Mac was such a new thing that, um, so he wrote the first computer program that, you know, got the guys away from the, the tombstone. <laughs> so it, yeah, got them, cut them away from the tombstone. They would, <laughs> they would put a wow. stick on a scale and the computer would register the weight and then they would, they would hit a piece of putty with a microphone under it and they would rotate the stick as they hit it so they could get three different pitch readings off of the stick and then the computer would uh, assign a number to it and they had a slot that went from zero to 99 you know about a hundred tubes mm -hmm. and they would just start putting it all the way in from zero to 99 and then you hit the second uh, second phase and then you do the next stick and it would tell the computer would say that stick goes with number 36 wow. and then this stick goes with number 52 and then you would pair them that way. So that became the, you know, the industrial <laughs> computerized pitch machine. I have a friend that he said Vic paid him three cents a pair. So he got really good at it and he could do his job in half a day. And, yeah. and make enough money. So, <laughs> I mean, if you are good at that, that'll add up pretty quick. Um, yep. <laughs> that video I was talking about where it was, you know, I, it looked, it's hard to tell the dates with like when it's on YouTube, but I think it was 90s. Like, I think it had that same process where it was a guy hitting what looked like a little like, you know, look like putty. And then he put it in a tube. Um, did that system get used for a while, if not still being used on a larger scale? Oh, they went to, uh, well, you know, eventually, I don't, I'm not really sure, but eventually, uh, probably mid to late 80, uh, 90s is when they actually developed the machine, the, uh, okay. you know, the conveyor. Uh, yeah. 
the 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 same basic machine that we have today. Okay. So you know it it feeds a stick one at a time onto a onto a a slot. The hammer hits it while the stick rotates. It measures the uh, the the pitch, yeah. gives the aggregate, and then it goes down to conveyors, kicks off, and then goes to the next machine, which weighs it, and then pairs that up. So probably about fifteen years of guys doing it. Okay. When after he moved away from his uh, his basement and and got an actual shop in Commerce Way and wow in Dedham. <laughs> so this obviously Vic Firth, you think of like the perfect pair or a perfect pair. This goes along with this kind of matching and really paying attention to to that kind of stuff and pushing forward with the innovation of you know getting sticks to to match and and uh, be much more quality checked and all that stuff so that's yeah that, and that I, makes I think sense. that was just part of Vic as the man you know like he just he does was not a kind of person that would accept second rate uh, the amount mm -hmm. of uh, it was one of the things when I first started working there that that really struck me is the amount of sticks that they would uh, reject um, that either became firewood to heat the factory okay. you know they they had furnaces uh, that that would dry the sticks and and uh, kilns and all that, or or would become seconds for you know uh, an off brand you know stick something like that. But he just wouldn't accept his name yeah. being put on something that wasn't very good. Yeah. Now you read my mind. I was going to say, well, what do you do with all those sticks? And I think that's a good way to do it. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't just throw them away. All right. So then, let me ask you: while this is going on in the world of drumming. Was Vic Firth at this point, like now when I think of Vic Firth, it's, you know, in big letters, Vic Firth. I mean, it is, it's Vic Firth. It's huge. What, <laughs> how was it going? I hope that made sense. How was it going in, well, in popularity? I, no, I always laugh because, you know, there's a perception of a company that's, it's huge. It's a, you know, we, and I, I always get it, um, you know, early on, my first my first job at Vic was the director of internet activities because the internet was pretty young back then and nobody had websites. Um, you know, and people would write and say, is there a job in your uh, media department? And it's like, well, unless I quit, I had, you know. <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> no, there's not. So, uh, you know, like when people think of a huge company, I mean, we were literally six of us in the six to eight of us in the headquarters. Wow. You know, that just did everything. In 2000? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Probably all the way up until, you know, 2010. We we wore a lot of hats, um, you know, each one of us. Now, they, they still had their production, you know, which is three shifts of people making the products. But as far as marketing, sales, you know, there was pretty much one person for each job. Wow. It was uh, it was a pretty small operation. I mean, you know, as big as it was, I was amazed too when I first, when he offered me a job because I had started a website really early on, uh, very very early in the internet, like the one of the first drum websites uh, called the Drum Club, <laughs> and Vic saw it and said, "I want, I want that," and and basically offered me a job, and I'd never been to Vic Firth. I was an endorser, but um, so I went to Boston. And the cab pulled up to the to the company, and I just went. I think you've made a mistake. This, you know, it's just in a strip mall of other, you know, like other businesses, and yeah. this one little door, and that's it. That's it. And you walk in, and it's one little room and three offices, and you know, a guy that has an office under the stairs in the in the back. So <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, it was a small, very small organization. And, you know, we it was it's a family, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. But when did it become in popular culture, like a successful company that's like a, a, a household name that's synonymous with with drummers? Like when did endorsers start to come on and, and it be what we know? It's really kind of hard to say. A lot of drummers played Vic Sticks, you know, as they did capella and you know all the other uh, uh regal tip and mm -hmm. you know all the other other sticks but uh i think gad was the first signature artist for vic and steve had uh he had 
Yamaha for a brief amount of time made sticks in the early 80s, I'm thinking. So he had played a a, a Gretsch Sonny Payne stick, and I guess Yamaha had started their drum company, and they wanted him to play their stick, so they made him a signature stick, which is kind of based off of that Sonny Payne stick. And... And I get, I'm not really sure the story, whether he was unhappy with the quality or, you know, but uh, Vic, Vic was a guy that always, he loved music and he, he went to jazz clubs all the time and he, and he knew all the up and coming drummers and he knew Steve and, you know, basically talked to him and said, what are you doing? You know, I can make your sticks for you. And so that was Hmm. the first signature stick for Vic. And it's a great uh, first stick. Yeah, a great first stick. And then the next stick was uh, Harvey Mason, which was actually a student of Vic's. Harvey was a, he was a concert percussionist, and he went through the Boston Conservatory and learned how to play concert percussion, moved to L.A., and, you know, went from playing on soundtracks to uh, the story is, is that he... Uh, you know, the drummer didn't show up for a, for a gig and somebody says, does anybody know how to play drum set? We need this thing. And Harvey said, yeah, I can do that, hmm. which, of course, he did. And, uh, yeah. you know, a few years later, Harvey is, is you know, amazing drum set player. And that was the second drum, the signature stick. So I think it just kind of started a little bit and then steamrolled. And then, you know, as as what happens, people start talking and say, you know, you know. It just becomes more and more popular. Yeah, that's not uh, it's clearly not on accident, though. It's because the quality's there, and it's a uh, uh, it's not an overnight success. Which there are great overnight successes, but it was obviously a slow burn from a passionate, you know, group of drummers. Obviously, starting with Vic, but it sounds like everyone was was really passionate. Um, so. Um, Moving forward here, I want to save time at the end because I have some uh, questions from people on social media who submitted for me to ask you. Um, so let's just go ahead and move forward here. Then then obviously um, Vic is getting older and all that stuff. The company's getting bigger. Um what happened then? I mean, I know you guys, your practice pads are very, you know, I, I have one. They're just kind of the synonymous like the standard practice pad that everyone has um what happens then in the 90s and 2000s and beyond well i think you know it's a it's kind of a natural progression where you're um you know you look at a need i think that's the way vic thought and the way that that all of us thought you know his his we would have a meeting a week where everybody is just kind of an idea dump of i've got this idea and i want to do this and vic was always the guy that you know, he he loved every everybody who worked there. He loved them. And we were like, you know, cats. We would fight mm-hmm. all the time. You know, we we're all the same personality type and we would just fight each other all the time. But we were all going in the same direction. So he would he would have people in, uh, have us all in. And, you know, what are you seeing? What's the need? Oh, you know, like, have we ever thought about making headphones? You know, like exactly. Yeah. Or have we ever thought about making practice pads? Or I saw this thing that this guy was doing and I I have an idea. And, And so he was kind of that he encouraged ideas. He never, you know, never really took credit for everything. He just, you know, he just wanted that progression of what's the next thing what's the next thing he always sure it was he always felt like, okay, I got to be looking out for the next thing. Yeah, extremely uh, innovative, obviously. Those headphones, it's so funny you mentioned that. I kind of forgot about that. I, not every drummer, but most drummers in the world have some experience wearing those Vic Firth headphones. Every studio has a pair, you know, for drummers. Um, they're great. I mean, those are, are those a li- do you guys license stuff like that? Or do you make in-house? Do you like, we're going to start building headphones? Oh. No, no. You know, like there are some products that we OEM or we get other manufacturers yeah. to make. Sure. Uh, obviously, we don't have the the uh, capabilities of making a lot of electronics. And, and, you know, it's just a it's a process. There are there are problems with old headphones. You know, you start off and that's kind of the way it works in the industry or you you try something. Vic always had a, a thing that he said to all of us is. He said, uh, as long as you have more successes than failures, 
you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, <You know? laughs> that's good. That's and a good that way was, to look at it. And he never really cared whether something we really wanted to do just completely bombed. And he had many sticks and different ideas that he tried that were just terrible. But, um, you know, you don't know until you try it. And no, so definitely. so I think that's the uh, you know like we have certain amount of things that we we have other manufacturers like headphones you know obviously but um, to OEM for us but yeah. uh, it's it's based off of our specifications and our design and and those type of things yeah no it's funny you say that because uh, in addition to my show here I record and edit a bunch of business podcasts and failure is such a big buzz thing now where it's like, you know, if you're not failing, you're not trying. We have fail cake to celebrate failures. So it's very, uh, <laughs> very popular. Yeah, now. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's like that as much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I want to succeed and not fail as much. But but you do need yeah. to try things. If you're not failing, you're not trying. So um, that's cool. You guys obviously do a lot of uh, have have a lot more successes than than failures. But uh so then bring us up to modern times here. Um, obviously, Vic is no longer with us, um, which is, you know, terrible. But he God, talk about an amazing life. Um, what was the kind of the end of his his time like? And then the merger with Zildjian. Yeah. Um, well, Vic had retired from the symphony. Um, I'm trying to think when that was. I was there. Um don't remember the exact year they retired from the symphony, but, you know, basically getting older, you know, you get aches and pains. He probably could have stayed mentally. He was, you know, so with it and so energetic yeah. all the way through that he could have stayed. But, uh, you know, like his his favorite conductor, Seiji Ozawa, was, had left and, and, you know, he decided it was time to retire for the symphony, but he still kept going back and playing. You know, yeah. but um, I think it got to that point where he had he had two daughters and neither one of them really wanted to to run the company or to take the company forward mm -hmm. um, as a family owned business. And so that's when he started looking for and he entertained a lot of, of you know, uh, pr prospective companies to come in and purchase the, the Vic Firth name. The Zildjian family made the most perfect sense because right there in Boston family run you know very uh storied history and and everything like that so you know I think yeah. we were all kind of on pins and needles when that process was happening but sure. you know just so so relieved and so excited when when that took place when the purchase took place and then Vic stayed on for another uh several years after that for the transition between uh the the company, you know, Vic Firth moving into the the Zildjian headquarters. So yeah, yeah, and Zildjian makes sticks as well that I used for a long time for for a number of years. Um, that were very nice drumsticks, which obviously I'm sure in the drum in the cymbal factory they weren't actually they were being supplied by you know someone else, which I'm assuming was associated with you guys. Um, actually, but, it was uh, they were making sticks, and I I don't know the year again, but because um, it's not a Vic Firth thing, yeah. but they they were making sticks out of the same factory that Vic was making sticks out of, and uh -huh. the Banton, and then they decided to get more serious about it and purchase a their own factory in Alabama, which they did, and they were making sticks out of Alabama. Uh, went through a few years of just not being a high quality product mm -hmm. um and at which point you know the this was before zildjian bought vic it, vic went to uh to Armand and said what are you what are you doing or craigie and said you know we can make those sticks for you and they would be a lot better and so vic started making the zildjian sticks from uh, uh probably 2008 maybe wow I don't know the exact year there, but uh, we we were we had taken over the entire production of the the Zildjian sticks long before Zildjian bought Vic Firth. Mm, that's interesting. Good way to kind of get the relationship started, and um, and you know I'm sure they knew that they were all good people, um, which they are <laughs> yeah. from from my experience of having Paul Francis on the show from Zildjian, uh, great ambassador to to Zildjian. So, um, all right, so then. 
obviously moving forward there to kind of wrap up, um, unfortunately, July 26th. So this was, you know, close to when we're recording this. There was kind of an anniversary of it. Uh, Vic passed away about five years ago at the age of 85 in uh, 2015, which is right. very sad. But again, what a long, great life. Yeah. And, um, you know, we we actually operated for the first few years almost as separate companies, even though Zildjian had purchased the company. Vic was now our president instead of our owner, <laughs> which sure. is kind of strange. Yeah. But, um, you know, like there was a there was a long transition that I think really, really benefited all of us who worked for Vic for so long and the Zildjian company to to uh, really meld the two companies together versus, you know, OK, we bought it. Boom, you're part of this and, you know, you need to you need to change everything now. Yeah. <laughs> so so there was a really nice period of getting to know everyone, getting getting, you know, the the philosophies and the the ideas and how we work together. The transition couldn't have been better. Hmm. That's great. That's uh, not the case for many companies who are purchased and switched over. And I mean, that's so just common in, in the history of drum brands where it's like now we belong to this company and the quality just went you know to hell and then we're you know the the, the brand closes 10 years later or something like that so that's really cool that it that it worked out um and it still continues to be super high quality great stuff um that i use vic firth sticks and practice pad and, and i have those headphones so i'm, I'm a i'm a believer <laughs> Great. You're helping pay my salary. How's that? Good, good, good. I need to break more sticks. Um, <laughs> you do. All right. So now that we're all kind of through the history of it, this is something kind of fun that I think I've done once or twice before, but I want to, if it's okay with you, Mark, I want to ask you a couple questions that people have submitted. So other Vic Firth fans are curious about a couple things. Um, and before we do that, let me say thank you to uh, Don McCauley for kind of getting this started don is obviously charlie watts drum tech and has been a very good friend of the show for a long time who connected me with joe testa which um is uh, a new friend to the show um and i'm just honored that these guys kind of you know helped set this up so this is really cool so thank you to those guys um now on to the questions are you ready for some uh vic firth questions from some fans. <laughs> I'll do my best. You know, this is <laughs> it's it's kind of the hot seat because, you know, I wasn't there at the beginning. I've been there for over 20 years, but uh Sure. I kind of know my way around. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll but be all right. I I cannot guarantee every single answer is, you know. Yeah. No it, no haters out there. How's no. That? If you don't know it, we'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this first one is from Lewis Abbott, and I might, if there's any doubles, we'll, um, we'll, you know, put lump them together. But and you sort of answered this a little bit, but what's involved in the process of designing a signature stick with an artist? Which is a very great question. Oh, and then actually, Andrew Lamb asked that same question. Well, it really, um, it really starts with the artist. You know, it's a, it's a conversation uh, about what they like, what are the what are the products that they have used in the past that they really like? What are the what are they really wanting that's different from something that they really like? Like a lot of times our signature artists come out of actually their their Zilt their Vic Firth players already mm -hmm. and they might use one stick and they think, I really like a 5A, but it just doesn't have enough leverage or it or it feels clunky or it, you know. So the process starts with total feel and what are you looking for? And what's your style of playing? Are you wanting more power? Are you wanting more finesse? Are you wanting this? You know, yeah. so it starts off with a, a very broad sense of, you know, what kind of diameter feels the best in your hands. Now let's talk about length and how much leverage that has. Let's talk about the taper. Do you want, do you want that, that rebound uh, right off the symbol? You want that really fast tape, you know, like a longer taper, a shorter taper. Uh, and then it starts getting down to the specifics of the bead itself, you know, like, okay, what's, 
what type of sound do you want out of mm-hmm. your cymbals or and then uh, you know frankly a lot of it comes down to do we already make that stick you know like we don't have any products that are the same in our catalog and you know that's one of the kind of things you know, like everybody would say, okay, make me a signature stick. I want the 5A. I was going to say, you know, so like, I like a 5A okay. kind of feel. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like I think we make probably 35 A's, you know, with uh-huh. just a little bit here or there, you know, like, and it really gets to be splitting hairs a little bit in that, in that world. But, um, you know, like it, it really does come down to something very unique. Yeah. You know, so when we were designing uh, the Benny Grab, and I say we uh, or stick designers, um, when they're designing, you know, it it comes down to Benny, and you know, he wants this, but maybe this, but maybe this, and so you send him five different variations, and he plays with them, and you know, he goes back and forth, he goes, oh, I like that one, but I like this one better, but if you could just do, you know, so very rarely does a an artist know exactly what they want as far as dimensions and the amount of taper and the, you know, guys are just not built like that. They're built for feeling a drumstick. Yeah. So you have to go off of that versus trying to Frankenstein. This is what we always call it. Frankensteining a drumstick. You can't, I like the five, a with the neck of a three, a with a tip of a five B, you know, you, that just produces an awful drumstick yeah. every single time. Yeah. So, so okay. it always has to start with a feel conversation. Yeah. Less specific, more just, I mean, like you said, you start broad and then you work down to prototyping and all that stuff. So, um, right. Great answer. Good start. Um, so Josh Kanuski, um, who I've talked to before, um, also a, a young father. We've talked about that before. Um, he said, and you answered this. So he said, who is the first drummer to be endorsed with a custom stick, which you said was Steve Gadd, correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. So we're ahead of the game here. Um, and then we have a few people, uh, Sergio Araguin and Thomas Collard both asked what happened to the Vic Firth, uh, culinary products. And y- y- I'm assuming you said Banton was already making grinders and pepper mills and stuff that had to be associated with that. Right. 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 They, they made those products and, and they were made under the Banton name okay. uh when when vic bought the factory uh bought banton i think we continue to produce the banton name but they had actually gone bankrupt so we had to pull the you know pull the name off of banton because they were being sold in culinary stores uh, around the world and things like that and vic said and he was always really kind of funny he goes i ah, you know a lot of there's a lot more people who eat than play drums so you know <laughs> I think we'll keep it. Wow. And he really loved that world of being in the, you know, like the celebrity chef. Like we had Mario Batali, you know, back in the, the day when that was uh, a household name and people knew that sure. we had several celebrity chefs that had signature pepper mills and, you know, products. Really, really loved that. It, it ultimately came down to, um, you know, after Zildjian had bought the company, we had grown so large with the with the Vic Firth brand that there was literally no room in the factory to keep up with our drumstick production. And it was kind of a distraction and it was a part of the factory they needed. And they were making money at it, doing fairly well, but not big enough to spin it off into its own thing. So mm. that, w- that decision was made to, you know what, let's focus on percussion <laughs> yeah it's a sad day when the the last uh pepper mill left the the vic firth factory and um yeah. i got about five or six of them i i, I went and like you know grab grab what i could before it was gone so yeah they're really nice well, <laughs> I've, I've looked oh online. they're really nice they're they're great yeah. all right next question so andrew messina aka chocolate milk on instagram <laughs> asked when did the 5a become your most popular stick oh i I don't have the answer to that. Okay. But I do know that um, just as a, you know, an aside, we sell more 5As than almost any other product that we make. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the amount of sales that we have for 5As are larger than most other drumstick companies. Wow. <laughs> it, is, it is a no, you know, like there is no other stick that is the, you know, chocolate milk of <laughs> the drumstick world than the 5A. <laughs> there you go. 
that hope that hopefully that answers your uh, question there chocolate milk um okay so this next one i actually don't have a name for it. it's not on their account but uh the ink is here is the username said um how does the company maintain sustainable practice of the wood supply which is a very good question well it's actually um it's it's a question born out of another marketing campaign but hmm. the wood the wood suppliers uh we use wood suppliers from uh western tennessee and it's part of the natural the the national forestry foundation okay and it is a sustainable uh it, it's a sustainable process you know obviously they're not doing deforestation in in tennessee because then they don't have any you know like they sure. plant trees for every tree they harvest so right, yeah. it's not a you know we do a lot of things in our environmental you know the biggest thing is the the wastewater and the and the sawdust and the you know the the different parts of the manufacturing process that uh that we reclaim but as far as growing trees for every drumstick you don't really have to do that because that's part of that that company yeah. and we do not own our own um uh, our own lumber facility or you know that's got it they yeah. make they make uh, wood for furniture and other really large industries <laughs> sure yeah no i'm glad that you're not like uh you know we go into the rainforest in uh costa rica and we just burn it all down and uh take <laughs> everything yeah and, i mean we we do you know like there is decisions to be made on what type of wood to use and of you know we would never use a rosewood or a or a type of wood that was endangered you of know of course yeah I could, so. I mean, it's just safe to assume that before I, you even answered that, that y you guys seem always very on the up and up, but, um, but those are good questions to ask. Like there's like the, you know, soda companies that are dumping stuff and polluting water for entire countries. So it's <laughs> right. I, right. Once you get big enough, those do become problems. Um, and then the very last question is Ben from Big Fat Snare Drum um, asked, why won't you endorse him? <laughs> so I think that might be a personal question where you guys can talk <laughs> about that later. Uh, Ben's a funny guy. I just wanted to include that. Oh, we love Ben. We love Big Fat Snare Drum, too. Yeah. Well, it, it is interesting because we get that question all of the time. And yeah. endorsements, you know, it's a it's a very difficult thing because the, especially now that uh, there are so many great drummers and there's so many avenues for people to play, uh, you know, back in Steve Gadd's time, you know, if you didn't play at the baked potato, then, you know, you're not really worthy of being an endorser. So yeah. it was fairly easy to say you are playing, you are, you know, now you could have an Instagram star that may or may not really be able to play the drums you know <laughs> so it, it it really gets difficult and yeah. there's so many players we would love to accept everybody because we want everybody playing our products especially those people who love our products but at the same time you got to sell some wood you know <laughs> yeah they need to be out i mean that's i completely get it and it makes perfect sense where obviously I'm sure you guys get, I'm sure you field many emails of, Hey, I'm, I'm a young drummer and I'm playing X amount of gigs and I'm doing all this. But um, now can I just ask as a guy who's, you know, never has been and probably never will be endorsed by a drumstick company. Like if you're a major drummer, I mean, let's say you're Steve Gadd, does he get like a regular package of like, here's your drumsticks, here's your drumsticks for the month. Like how does that usually work? If you're a, if you're a, a level top dog drummer yeah and and you just described it a level b level you know like there there are different levels to our you know what we what we have uh obviously steve gets as many sticks as he wants and yeah obviously he gets the royalty off of any signature product that we sell wow now cool. we we do not pay anybody to play our sticks so even if it's a a player who uh who doesn't have a signature stick, but they're endorsed by the company, they are not getting a paycheck from us to represent the company or to speak on our behalf or, you know, yeah. any of that kind of thing. It doesn't happen. You know, we're not, we're not uh, in the Nike world of that, no. but uh, you know, it, it depends on the level of players and what we think the reach is going to be. And I'm speaking a little bit for their artist relations department, which they might have a different, uh, way of putting it but uh you know there is an allotment that a lot of guys get 
guys and girls will get an allotment of, you know, X number of sticks, depending on the tour that they're on. You know, if you're playing arenas, you might get a lot of sticks. If Mm -hmm. you're, if you're playing the jazz clubs and, you know, you might go through a pair of sticks a month, you know, like it's kind of based off of the guy and the style and, you know, like in the need because guys are not, you know, nobody takes advantage of a relationship that you have. And what those guys also get is that that relationship of calling in and saying, I need, oh, I need a high and heavy pitch. I I want them at this pitch. I want them at this, uh, you know, this weight. And, you know, like we'll we'll pick very specific sticks for you know our higher level guys so that they can always reach in their bag and have exactly the stick that they want so there's there's benefits to the to the endorsement relationship and not all of it's monetary mm. at all <laughs> got it well wow. really good to know because sometimes you just think uh, you don't know what to think with like some of the the major endorsements and all that stuff but uh, in a nutshell you guys keep your players stocked with sticks so they never go you know yeah, and we have a MD. lot of players that buy sticks from us. Okay, you know, they're they're buying. Uh, you know, they might get a reduced price from us, but what they're buying mm-hmm. is that relationship and and that that customization of either picking sticks or we, you know, somebody might play a five A, but they want their name or their signature on the five A so that you know they can sell them in the merch stands or whatever. But uh, so yeah. we do a lot a lot of that type of thing. Yeah, I have a friend, Aaron Roy, who um, plays Vic Firth, and he plays in a ton of bands. Like, you know, he's from Cincinnati, but he plays all over, and uh, I think he does that. I think he has signature sticks that are, um, I would imagine, are along that same line of, um, you know, exactly what you just described. So, sure. Cool. Well, Mark, that was fun. I got to do that more on the show and just ask people questions and and get some other uh, insights from people. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions questions that was great um i posted that about two hours before the interview so i'm glad we got that was a pretty the right number of questions i think um so that was great (laughs) well mark um usually i say where can people find you but obviously i think people can just go to vicfirth.com um and then if you have anywhere else you want people to be able to find you personally i mean i I guess now is the time to uh let us know you know what you're up to and are you playing any bands or anything uh i don't i have this day gig that um <laughs> yeah. yeah me too <laughs> I don't know if you heard about it. um no i i have a actually personally i have a publishing company that i've i've written several books that oh, cool. uh is is a big thing in the uh in the scholastic or the concert world nice. um and a drum set book with stanton moore if anybody wants to check that out fresh cool. approach to drum set um so um i am in charge of all education for zildjian and vic fur so if you see anything in the you know in the vic Firth rudiments or web rhythms or you know all of that stuff and now we're really my transition into the zildjian education role was only in the last year so we're really getting started with uh, a lot of stuff going on in the zildjian education world so you can find me uh there zildjian.com vicbirth.com man both great companies um who have been very you know helpful to me by coming on the show and helping to uh share their story to people who listen so um yeah mark thanks so much for being here and uh i hope to see you someday at one of the drum shows doing the uh all the educational stuff boy i'm so excited about getting back to a drum show <laughs> i never too. thought i would miss traveling to a drum show but yeah my gosh <laughs> yeah maybe next year <laughs> yep all right thanks mark <laughs> thank you so much for having me If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.